Today's show is brought to you by Squarespace. Start building your website today at squarespace.com. Enter offer code UNIVERSE at checkout to get 10% off. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. And by Audible. Audible has over 180,000 audiobooks and spoken word audio products. Get a free 30-day trial today at audible.com slash universe. There were better places to be than on the windy top of an exposed tower in Padua, Italy, on the night of January 7, 1610. For one thing, it was bitterly cold. Actually, that one thing was the only thing, and the cold was more than enough. Even as far inland as Padua is, the wind bite from the Adriatic could be terrible. And it was worse still if you were fool enough to be standing on top of the highest structure anywhere in town. But the night wasn't just very cold. It was also very, very clear. And for Galileo Galilei, a professor of the sciences at the city's university, that meant work. Galileo had recently come into possession of what scientists like him were calling a telescope and his was an extraordinary one. Just two feet long and easily portable, but still powerful enough to magnify objects an astounding 30 times. What Galileo wanted to magnify tonight was Jupiter, the biggest, brightest, and most dramatic of the six planets, and one that would pop quickly into view through the eyepiece of his instrument. It wouldn't be the first time he'd look Jupiter's way, but the cloudless sky meant it could be the best. It might reveal who knew what about the strangely striped, wonderfully colorful world that was second only to the moon in its dominance of the night sky. So Galileo trudged to the top of his tower, carrying his telescope with him, and turned his gaze upward. Jupiter swam obligingly into view, but something else came into focus along with it there were three pinpoints of light on the left side of the planet. They looked like stars, but they couldn't be stars. Galileo had already plotted the background stars along the track Jupiter traveled, and these hadn't been there before. What's more, the stars were oddly positioned, lined up horizontally just at the level of Jupiter's equator. Stars could form all manner of patterns, but it always took a little imagination to give them meaning. There was no great water dipper in the sky, no great hunter, just the starry pictures people liked to draw in their minds. But these three stars made a line as straight as if they'd been drawn by an engineer's quill. Galileo pondered the stars, sketched them in his notebook, then packed up his telescope and went home to bed. When he returned to the tower a few nights later, he found that things had changed. There were only two of the stars now, and one was on the opposite side of Jupiter. A night or two later, the vanished star reappeared, also off to Jupiter's right-hand side. And then the third one joined them there. Finally, remarkably, a fourth star showed itself, also lined up along the horizontal, and also over a few nights, apparently in motion. And then, all at once, Galileo sorted out the puzzle. These weren't stars. They were moons. Big, busy, fast-moving moons dancing around Jupiter like a small swarm of honeybees. That, of course, was not how it was supposed to be. Earth, and only Earth, had a moon. It was one of the things that made it special, a planet so consequential that it had an escort and a harbor light to illuminate its nights. Jupiter was just one of the other planets that decorate the sky. But now it appeared that Jupiter was much, 
much more. It was a little solar system within the larger solar system, a planet so big it behaved like a sun. Even if it was a sun so small, it produced no light of its own. But there was more to it than the fact that Jupiter had its own little family of worlds that turned the known science of the night sky on its head. It was that this was proof that the accepted truths about the cosmos were wrong. Every single object ever spotted in the sky appeared to move in a great bowl around the most favored world that was Earth. They were placed here for only one possible reason, for us, for our wonder and our pleasure. Now came these rogues, four moons that paid no heed to our world, that circled their own grandparent, and they changed everything. Galileo Galilei had long known that it could not be so that Earth was the hinge point of the cosmos. It was human illusion and human vanity to think it was, but saying such a thing out loud could land a man in very deep trouble. Now, however, here was proof, proof that would not only require listing four new fantastical worlds into the cosmic literature, but more important, proof that blew up the very foundations of science. It was one man on one tower who made that discovery. But it was the planet Jupiter that made the magic possible. Next, how Jupiter helped shape the solar system itself. But first, a word from our sponsor. Jupiter's massive size and large red spot are features that make the planet distinct among the other planets in our solar system. Take Jupiter's lead and make your website stand out with Squarespace. Squarespace offers customizable designs so that you can easily tailor your website to fit your needs. With their drag-and-drop tools and modern templates, you'll build a site that looks professionally designed regardless of skill level. No coding required. Plus, you get a free domain if you sign up for a year. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code UNIVERSE to get 10% off of your first purchase. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. Jupiter is a planet that moves quickly. It rotates fully once every 9.9 hours. Think how often you rotate between work, school, and home life in the span of 9.9 hours. When your rotation is in full swing, let Audible entertain you. Audible has more than 180,000 audiobooks and spoken word audio products to choose from. Take Audible with you when you're on the go by listening on your smartphone, computer, or tablet. Listen to my book, Simplexity. Exploring why simple things become complex and how complex things can be made simple. Find this book and other books of all genres at audible.com. As a special offer to my listeners, you can get a free 30-day trial today by signing up at audible.com slash universe. That's audible.com slash universe. Jupiter has been an admired fixture in the night sky since the time of the ancients, one of the naked eye planets that were seen before so remarkable an instrument as a telescope had even been dreamed of. Frankly, it would have been hard for a naked eye not to have spotted Jupiter. The fifth planet from the sun is far and away the solar system's biggest. At 86,000 miles in diameter, it's more than 10 times as big as Earth and nearly 29 times bigger than little Mercury. In fact, all of the solar system's other planets combined could fit within Jupiter. But big does not mean dense. Jupiter may be the second densest of the four giant planets after Neptune, but it's less dense than all four of the pipsqueak planets. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And that makes sense. Mercury is overwhelmingly made of iron. Earth has a heavy metallic inner and outer core and a huge mantle. Mars and Venus are both hard-baked, rocky worlds as well. 
But Jupiter? Jupiter is about 90% hydrogen and 10% helium. It spins very fast. A single Jupiter day takes just 10 hours compared to Earth's 24. And it's made of such fluffy stuff that that great speed actually causes it to bulge at the waistline, a full 6,000 miles larger measured side to side than it is measured pole to pole. More important, Jupiter's composition reveals something essential about the planet, something about what it might have been. A 90 to 10 hydrogen to helium ratio is almost exactly the same as the Sun's own composition. And Jupiter is in fact only 30% smaller than the smallest brown dwarf stars. But if Jupiter had stellar aspirations, they were snuffed quickly. It would have to be about 80 times more massive than it is to reach the critical ignition point and light the fuse that would start the fusion that powers a star like our own sun. Stellar nebulae don't generally have enough primordial dust to produce two stars. What's more, even if Jupiter did add more mass than it has, the first thing it would do would be to shrink slightly rather than grow, as increased gravity would pull the planet down into a more tightly packed space. That doesn't mean that Jupiter's great size doesn't already give it a powerful gravitational energy. It's so great that the compression that results from its gravity generates heat, and a lot of it. The result is that Jupiter is the only planet in the solar system that actually puts out more energy than it receives from the sun, running a budget surplus while all of the other worlds run eternal deficits. All of this gives Jupiter a kind of poignant duality. It's both a grand planet and a failed star, both an overachiever and an underachiever. But the mere fact of falling short of stellar status actually makes the planet a far more interesting body than a star could ever be. Our sun, after all, is little more than a great furnace, the boiler room that keeps the solar system humming. Jupiter is a more fanciful thing, with far stranger processes playing out in its great gassy interior. The upper cloud layers of Jupiter are its most conspicuous features. They're where you get the colorful bands and the great red spot, an anti-cyclonic or counterclockwise storm that's been raging for at least 300 years and is three and a half times larger than Earth. The clouds are composed mostly of ammonium crystals and ammonium hydrosulfide. The colors are caused by deeper chemicals like phosphorus or sulfur that rise to the surface and change shades as they react to the sunlight, producing brilliant stripes of orange and yellow and red and brown, a little bit like a permanent earthly autumn. Reacting to sunlight at all is no easy feat out in the shadowy reaches of the solar system where Jupiter orbits, more than five times further away than the Earth is. Out there, sunlight is a comparative nightlight, shining with just 4% of the brightness it does here. Jupiter's outer atmosphere is only a few dozen miles deep, and below it lies a region made of stuff most folks have never heard of metallic hydrogen, a layer running all the way down to the planet's core. Hydrogen and metal ought not to have a whole lot in common, except at the pressures this hydrogen is subjected to, a tidy 3.2 million times the pressure on Jupiter's surface. The hydrogen organizes itself into a kind of atomic solid, with the atom's electrons loosely bonded allowing them to conduct electricity. There's rainfall here, too, but it's a helium rain, droplets of light gas that have been squeezed to a liquid state. If you could stand on the surface of Jupiter, which you can't do any more than you could stand on a cloud, you would experience an atmospheric pressure equal to about 10 times Earth's sea level pressure, 
which would also mean a temperature of about 152 degrees, easily survivable in a spacesuit. But plunge down through the atmosphere, and plunge you would, and you would ultimately encounter temperatures exceeding 64,000 degrees, or six times hotter than the surface of the sun. And if those hard, deadly realities don't entirely rule out Jupiter as a place that could ever support life, there are its belts of powerful radiation, generated by charged particles in the solar wind interacting with the planet's magnetic field. So powerful are the radiation belts that the six spacecraft that have orbited or flown by Jupiter have had to suit up with shielding before their encounter, lest their innards get fried before they even got close. But Jupiter isn't the killing field it seems to be. In fact, there's a good case to be made that without the huge planet standing guard 483 million miles from the sun, life on Earth, or even Earth itself, might never have gotten started. In the solar system's earliest era, there was nowhere near the consistent census of stable planets that exist today. Planetesimals, little rogue worlds smaller than Mars, abounded, orbiting through the inner solar system in crisscross lanes of traffic. If other solar systems elsewhere in the galaxy are any indication, there might have also been so-called super-Earths, planets at least twice the size of ours, whizzing around the sun in orbits even tighter and swifter than Mercury's. This kind of chaos was gravitationally unsustainable, with all manner of orbital collisions possible. And that's just what happened, constant crack-ups, until Jupiter moved in to clean up the mess. Having not yet established its own fixed orbital lane, Jupiter was drawn close by the eddies of gravity in the sloppy inner solar system, drifting as close as 140 million miles from the Sun, or just half again the orbit of Earth. Throwing its gravitational weight around, Jupiter then proceeded to herd the planetesimals into a comparatively narrow band where they help provide the raw material for Mercury and Mars. Still not done cleaning house, it then pitched the remaining planetesimals toward the Sun where they collided with the super-Earths, demolishing them and removing their gravitational turbulence too from the inner solar system. The relatively clear field that was left behind allowed the debris that remained to contribute to the formation of Earth and Venus. Its job done and order established, Jupiter then tacked into the smoother gravitational winds and sailed out to its current spot, where it found a stable orbital lane. Even then, the giant planet that wanted to be a sun wasn't done looking after its little brother and sister planets. Storms of comets dive-bombing in from the outer solar system helped import water to Earth and the early Mars, and that was a very good thing. But they could also destabilize or destroy a young planet. For Jupiter, however, there may be life even closer to home. In the centuries after Galileo spotted his four great moons, astronomers have discovered 63 more. Many of them are closer to asteroids, less moon than rubble. But the four Galilean satellites are something else entirely. Named Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, after the lovers of Zeus, they're some of the most complex bodies in the solar system. They race around Jupiter in a configuration known as Laplace resonance, with Io in the innermost lane, making four orbits for every two orbits, completed by Europa next door, and every one orbit, completed by Ganymede, still farther out. Callisto, the most remote of the four major moons, has not yet fallen into this tidy pattern but it's on its way. 
Locked in this configuration, the moons play some interesting gravity chords among themselves. Every time one moon passes another on the eternal track of its orbit, it gravitationally plucks and stretches the next closest moon. This causes the interior of the little worlds to stay hot. On Io, that means volcanoes, everywhere, all over the tortured surface of the moon, some with plumes rising in the sky 30 times higher than Mount Everest. Such violence makes for some dramatic geology, but it's the potential for biology on the other moons that's more tantalizing. Ganymede and Callisto are known to have water below their surfaces, and the gravitational flexing should keep it warm and liquefied. There's even more promise on Europa, a bright white world covered with a thick shell of water ice Europa is believed to have a deep global ocean, rich with salts, minerals, and organic chemistry. For four billion years, the tidal flexing has acted like a planetary heartbeat, pumping the warm, amniotic waters around and around the globe. Chemistry plus energy plus time may be all that is needed to cook up life and Europa has had all three in abundance. NASA has approved a mission to Europa set to embark no later than 2022. It may not find life, not yet, but it may find more signs that Europa can and even should be home to it. Even sooner, in the summer of 2016, the space agency's Juno probe will go into orbit around Jupiter itself for a years-long study of its upper atmosphere. Juno will be the seventh spacecraft to visit Jupiter, and more, surely, are to come. There's much reason to make that trip. The sun may be the great monarch of the solar system, its power unquestioned, its physical laws felt everywhere. But like all such sovereigns, it's remote too, never venturing from its spot at the center of all things. Jupiter, by contrast, has been the caretaker, wandering here and there early on to organize the unruly mob of the smaller planets and then retreating to a place from which it could keep an eye on them all and protect them from harm. It will be a fitting reward if the great planet that fell short of star status and that did so much work to build a stable solar system all the same became the parent world of an ice white moon that just maybe is home to something living. I'm Jeffrey Kluger, and this has been Time's It's Your Universe. Follow me on Twitter, at Jeffrey Kluger. And join me next time as we visit Saturn, the glamour world. <laughs>